All right. Well, good afternoon, Corona Days Professional Development Group. It is me, Danette Edwards. Today, I am here with Shannon Deemer. She's going to talk to us today and lead this presentation, Ghosted, how to stay in touch with the disappearing hiring manager. And we want to know about this. We all want to know about this. So today, Shannon is going to cover um, learning how to avoid being ghosted in the interview process how to engage or re-engage hiring managers and remain top of mind with recruiters. Uh, she's also going to talk about how we can learn top tips to stand out in the crowded field of job seekers and how we can understand the main reasons hiring, hiring professional, professionals don't stay in touch post-interview and learn how to change it. A little about Ms. Deemer. Uh, with 10 years of expertise and certified endorse endorsements, Shannon Deemer is the founder and chief executive officer of the Deemer Group, a national talent acquisition solution serving hiring leaders in various industries. Shannon's proficient track record includes increased direct hire placement among teams, high client retention, and rapid job placements for mid-level to executive roles in a variety of industries. Her dedication and exceptional abilities have consistently yielded high growth within agencies and organizations throughout her profession. Before I turn this over to Shannon, I'm gonna say if you're in this group, if you're watching this webinar, if you catch us on the replay, if you are a hiring manager and you have a position, contact Ms. Zemer, right? If you are uh, a candidate searching for work and you have not registered, I, I posted her information twice. If you've not registered with her, uh, her company, go ahead and register with them. With that, I am going to turn it over to Shannon. Shannon, if I left anything at all out in your bio, please add it. Thank you. All right. First of all, uh, Danette, thank you so much for uh, inviting me um, to participate um, and to present to you guys today. Um, you did a fantastic job. Gosh, that bio uh, makes me sound amazing. Um, so I have been working in the recruiting space um, for nearly a decade now. Um, I've done everything from helping people with disabilities get back into the work world. I've helped marginalized populations um, to get into the work world. And then I transitioned to being a recruiter. I have talked to lots of hiring managers. Um, I have heard the pains of job seekers, trust me, uh, time and time again about um, not hearing back from recruiters, from agency recruiters, similar to myself, not hearing back from hiring managers, um, and of course, being left with uh, these feelings and emotions about why is this happening to me? Does, does it mean that I'm a bad candidate? Did I do something wrong? Is there something that I can change? Um, and I know people will flock to um, to webinars, um, workshops, um, literature, articles, whatever you can to get an advantage to figure out why these hiring managers aren't responding to you. Like what happened? You thought everything was going well, they disappeared on you. What can you do differently next time? And honestly, uh, most of the time there's not much you can do to change yourself. I, I don't, I never recommend that you change yourself but there are ways that you can remain connected um, and sometimes at least uh, get a response to give you some more information about why maybe they, they decided to move on with a different candidate um, or what's going on with the process before you go all crazy and, and get freaked out. So let me go ahead and share my screen here with you guys because I have uh, some slides. Okay, uh, so uh, I have asked the net if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, I don't want to go to the end of the presentation. If you have a question, uh, let's address it um, right then and there. So um, to start, um, Danette asked me if I would share a little bit uh, about my personal story. Um, and I thought it was completely relevant um, to what we are all experiencing right now. We are all going through um, a shared crisis um, as it relates to COVID. Many people are now unemployed, newly unemployed, underemployed, struggling to find employment. Um, even folks who are looking for a new employment in this climate 
which a year ago looked completely different. You didn't have to worry about any of those things. So um, to me, it is, it is a, a, a huge tragedy, um, but it's one that I'm confident that we can get through. Um, so my story, I would describe it as um, being marked by three major crises, um, major professional crises um, that kind of changed the trajectory of my career. And then there were a couple of minor ones as well. So I'm going to start with, you know, where I was. If you've seen those Facebook posts, um, how it started and, you know, where it is now, I'm going to tell you how it started and then I'll tell you what happened um, as a result of these crises in my life. So the first crisis, um, I am originally from New Orleans, Louisiana, um, and I lived in New Orleans at the time of Hurricane Katrina. So um, if you guys remember Hurricane Katrina and how it affected the people in New Orleans, um, it was like day and night. One day life just seemed like it was going along as usual. Um, there was a big storm coming our way, similar to this year. We've had tons of hurricanes this year as well. Um, but that year we had had uh, some hurricanes. Katrina came along, it was a big one. A lot of people evacuated, some didn't. They have this thing where People get uh, hurricane fatigue um, because of um, leaving for them. But at any rate, um, the, the storm hit New Orleans in a major way. And I went from uh, my life in New Orleans to being uprooted and moved to a completely different city. Um, my job ended very suddenly. Um, um, I, I no longer lived in New Orleans. I've never lived in New Orleans since Hurricane Katrina. Um, and it, it just threw everything into um, this, this spin that I was not prepared for. So that was the first crisis. The second crisis um, happened um, when I lived in Atlanta. I found myself jobless and pregnant at the same time, um, which is <laughs> not easy. Um, if you've ever had to job search while you're pregnant, it's not fun. There are tons of laws uh, where employers should not uh, discriminate against someone because they're pregnant. But the reality is it is difficult to find work while you are pregnant. And I was late stage pregnant. Um, so again, it was another crisis in my career where I was like, what do I do now? Jobless and pregnant. Um, the third crisis is the one that we all share, COVID. Um, I was um, growing my business, COVID hit and everything came to a screeching halt. Um, I had clients that had searches that they needed me to work on, and then all of a sudden, they didn't know what was going on with their business, and all of those things went on hold. So for me, it meant all of my income completely vanished overnight, okay? So those are the three major crises in my life. I had a couple of other ones um, that I had to work through as well. One I, I call bad timing. Um, I decided that I was going to pursue a doctorate degree um, in business psychology. Um, I relocated from Louisiana. I left a job in Louisiana and relocated to Chicago um, to pursue that degree. And this was all in the midst of the economy crashing and everyone struggling to find work. So it was bad timing uh, to decide to relocate and find a new job. Uh, the second minor crisis was divorce. And if anyone has been married and divorced, it is a process, it is stressful, um, and it certainly had an impact on my career. So that's how things started. How did things end up um, because of these crises? Well, for my first crisis, Hurricane Katrina, I decided to enter grad school. I decided to pursue my master's degree in industrial organizational psychology. It is a degree I likely would not have pursued um, if Hurricane Katrina didn't happen um, because the program was not offered um, in New Orleans at the time. Um, but I had relocated to Shreveport. They had a program nearby. Um, the program seemed like it was a good fit for me. And so I entered that program and it changed the trajectory of my career. 
due to the second crisis, being pregnant and jobless, I decided, I decided to start a business. Um, I am very grateful for my early clients um, who immediately jumped on uh, the bandwagon and worked with us. Um, and we have just been continuing to grow the business ever since. Um, and then the third crisis, COVID, I actually expanded the business. So after I had my freak out moment in March and April, I was able to step back, take a breath and come up with a strategy to expand the business. Um, and now we are offering temp services nationally because of COVID. Um, prior to that, I had no interest in doing it, but because of COVID, we saw opportunity and decided to expand the business. Um, because of the minor crisis in my life, bad timing, I discovered my niche, um, which is working in recruiting, hiring, talent, uh, acquisition. Um, and because of my divorce, I was able to define myself as a professional. So for all of these bad things that happen, it took some work. It took some self-reflection and it definitely, um, it came with some risks, but I really can look back on each of those crises and think of something amazing um, that shifted in my career. I like to think of these as pivot moments. Um, I know that it's something that I think has been discussed in this group before, um, and it is something that everyone is talking about now. Um, you know, finding ways that you can, you know, pivot um, the direction of your career, um, pivot your skills and use it in a different way that maybe you didn't think of before. Um, the job market is pivoting as more people are starting to work from home and more companies are becoming open to that. So I really want you guys to take some time and look inward and figure out your moments of pivot. Um, what can you do to take a crisis and turn it into something that you can celebrate? So that's my story, but let's go ahead and get into what you guys are here for, which is this whole concept of being ghosted um, by hiring managers. So um, just like any good presentation, we have to start with a definition. Um, ghosted is probably a term that you guys have heard as it relates to personal relationships. It's defined on the internet as um, an end to a personal relationship by suddenly and without explanation withdrawing from all communication. So you're talking to someone, you're engaged with them, and then all of a sudden they just disappear. You don't know why, you're not able to get back in touch with them, they're not responding to you. This happens in several situations. Um, many of us ghost people in the sales process. Hello, I have to raise my hand on that one. Um, or volunteer commitments, right? You're talking to someone, you seem like you're an interested buyer, something changes for you, you ghost your salesperson. Many of us also have those um, eager salespeople that constantly call our phones and text us and email and following up, um, but we have completely ghosted them. We have disappeared. We have no interest in talking to them again. Um, we typically hear the term ghosted, of course, um, in dating situations, but it is increasingly becoming popular in the world of work. Um, and we hear about people being ghosted um, on both sides. So there are employers being ghosted by job seekers, right? Someone that they think is a good fit for the organization, um, and then suddenly they disappear. They're not interested. They have no idea why. Um, no call, no show. So if you've ever worked a job and just decide you quit and you decided not to tell your employer, that was ghosting them. For you guys, what's relevant is that we're starting to see uh, hiring managers who interview candidates and they just don't respond. You know, you think the conversation went well, you think the interview went well, they tell you that they'll be back in touch with you within a matter of days or weeks and you never hear from them again and you never get any updates as well. So this feels terrible, I'm sorry, that's a misspell, feels terrible when you're on the receiving end, but many of us have probably done it before. We've probably ghosted someone before. The big question is, why do people do it? Um, and there's a number of reasons. One is avoiding an awkward conversation. Um, I don't sign up to have awkward conversations when I wake up in the morning. I'm quite sure many of you don't as well. And so when you know that you are approaching an awkward conversation, a lot of people just say, eh, uh, I'll avoid it. I'll think about that later. I'll call them another time. Um, 
in those instances, a lot of people are delaying and then it ends up being a ghost um, towards the end. Um, for me as a recruiter, I always tell my team to do the things that they don't wanna do um, the most first in the day right? Make that the first thing you do, get up in the morning and call a candidate and tell them that they, do, they are not hired for the job. I tell them that because it's the thing that they don't want to do. As recruiters, we love calling people and telling them how they're a great fit for an opportunity and that they're, you know, they've been selected to interview or that they've been selected for the job. One of the things we hate the most is telling a candidate that they were not selected. It is not a fun conversation, which is why I always recommend that you do it first. Um, some people ghost because they're uncomfortable with the level of communication. Um, maybe they, they feel like it's too familiar. Um, perhaps they feel like, you know, this person is not a good person. I don't like talking to them. Um, so they just avoid the conversation altogether. Uh, some folks just assume the other person doesn't care. Um, so if you've ever interviewed um, and the interview seemed to go okay, um, it wasn't your finest moment, um, but it went okay and you think you still have a shot, um, that hiring manager just may feel like you don't care. And so if you don't care, they don't care either. And so they're not gonna call to tell you, um, you know, their decision or to move forward. In some cases, um, there is no decision or the person is unable to make one. Um, in the work world, that is when they are afraid to commit. Um, I have employers all the time who say, oh, it's a great candidate, but I'm not sure if I should make a hire yet. Um, perhaps I should see some additional candidates before I decide. And they just leave you hanging until they figure out whether or not they want to hire you or someone else. Um, so they ghost you. Um, sometimes people are optimistic and think they think that something will change. Um, so if they just wait another day, wait another two days, wait another week, something will change and they can call you with a positive update. Um, ultimately, what happens is days turn to weeks, turn to you never hear from them again. Um, and my all-time favorite is they just simply forgot. They forgot to follow up with you. They forgot to close the loop. Um, and so you're waiting to hear from them. They've moved on with their life and they forgot to give you an update. Um, so these are the most common reasons for why people ghost others. So what can you do? Well, we have a few strategies and they are going to apply to different stages of the hiring process. So let's start with application. Um, the first thing is you want to send your resume or application to an employer and you don't want them to ghost you and that you want them to actually call you um, once they receive your resume um, because they're interested in speaking with you. So how do you stand out um, from a crowded field of qualified candidates? Well, here are my recommendations. The first is get referred, meaning networking is probably at an all time high of importance. Um, if you can get referred, meaning if you can connect with someone who already works there or is connected to someone who works there and they personally send your resume, chances are that you're going to get interviewed. Most hiring managers have a rule. If it is an internal referral, they will get an interview. In fact, there are people in my network Sometimes they refer over job seekers. Um, I may or may not have a position for them, but if they were referred by someone that I know that is in my network, um, and it, again, it has to be someone that I know, not just a complete stranger sending me a resume, but someone I know, if Danette sent me a resume and said, hey, Shannon, I wanna refer this person, that person 99% of the time is getting an interview. OK, so that's definitely one way that you can at least get your foot in the door. Plus, if you are getting referred, that means you have a contact that is an inside connection, which means you can get inside information. Ask that person questions about, you know, how they could be successful and how you could be successful in the, in the um, interview. And if 
um, you get ghosted after an initial interview, you can ask that inside person what happened. And they likely will have some insight into why a different decision was made. So throughout these recommendations, I'm going to give you guys some personal stories as well. And some of them are things that happened to me. Some of these things are things that have happened with job seekers or hiring managers that I've worked with. So inside connection, um, early in my career, I worked for the state of Louisiana. I decided I wanted to switch agencies. Um, I was referred over to um, the, the director of the new agency that I wanted to work for, had a really great interview. He seemed like he wanted to hire me on the spot, um, and then they didn't hire me. Um, I got ghosted. He didn't call me. I didn't get the job. Um, because I had an inside connection, um, I was able to find out that the interview did go well, they did want to hire me, but they had an internal employee who took precedence over me. If you've ever worked for a state agency, you know they have lots of rules um, in place to make sure that they take care of those who are already in state employment. So this person already was working with that agency, they took precedence, they got that job. However, about a month later, another position opened up. Um, and because I stayed in touch with my connection, as well as that director, um, I was again referred and hired uh, for the job the second time around. Um, if I didn't know why I got ghosted the first time, I likely would not have pursued it the second time, but it was that insider information that made a huge difference um, for me getting that job. And I loved it. It was the beginning of my career um, in helping others get a job. Um, the second advice that I would give is submit your resume with a recommendation from a reputable source. Um, so oftentimes I'll get a, a resume, sometimes it'll have references listed um, at the bottom of the resume or on the second page. Um, but um, I really love when I get a resume and they send me a prepared recommendation from someone who I'm familiar with, a leader within an organization that I'm familiar with. Um, it goes to show that they are already backed by others who say that this is a great person um, for you to hire. It also helps to address reasons that perhaps you left an agency or an organization in the past. Um, you can have that addressed in that prepared recommendation letter. The truth of the matter is hiring managers value the opinions of others, which is why internal referrals and letters of recommendation carry so much weight. Um, we do check references. References on the back end of a, a hiring process are typically a formality. Um, so when you send it um, and you're, you're being proactive by sending it with your resume, um, that's when the hiring manager is more likely to take that opinion into consideration for their hiring decision, okay? Um, now, you can reach out to someone that you are certain will write you a really good letter. Um, you can give them suggestions of things that you would like covered in the letter. I've had some people who have reached out for a recommendation. They have um, essentially written the recommendation and then sent it to someone and say, hey, can you read over this, edit it, um, and if you feel good about it, you know, put it on letterhead, send it to me so that I can include it in my application materials when I'm um, applying for a job. Um, whenever I get those from candidates, when I'm submitting them to my clients, my candidates that I send resumes with recommendation letters get interviews, right? It is a difference maker. So um, I recommend that you do it. Um, make sure that your reference is also willing to have a phone call reference at the end of the process if the hiring manager wants to speak with them again. Um, so I know a lot of people don't do this, even if you're applying in an, in an ATS, um, which is one of those, those great systems that we all love, I'm saying that sarcastically, um, where you have to fill out a ton of different screens before you can submit your application. Um, at times, they ask for you to upload your resume. 
they will also have somewhere where you can upload um, additional documents. Most folks are uploading a cover letter. You can also upload recommendation letters as well so that it is part of your complete package. Um, last but not least, expand your boundaries. So this one is fun. Um, I like to call it the general application. There's no job posted. Um, you have no idea if they're hiring, um, but you feel like this is a company that you want to work for. My recommendation is you prepare a resume and cover letter, which outlines your skills and how your skills can be beneficial to that company and just send it to a general mailbox. It may be an HR mailbox. It could be info at whatever the company's name is, but send the resume and cover letter. It will work its way into someone's hands um, that may make a decision to give you a call. They may put it on file with HR and give you a call when they have the right opportunity. And sometimes they have an opportunity available that they have not yet advertised. Um, one of my most recent positions, I did just that. I um, researched a company. I thought that my background was a good fit for it. Um, it aligned with my skill set. I prepared a resume and cover letter and just sent it to info at that company. Um, I didn't hear from them for probably a month, month and a half. And then one day out of the blue, the CEO reaches out and says, hey, I received your resume some time ago. Um, I haven't posted a job yet, but I saw your resume and wanted to speak with you about this position. Um, of course, um, I went through the interview process. The rest is history. I got the job. The job was never posted, it was never advertised, um, but I felt like the company was a good fit for me. So don't limit yourself to just opportunities that are posted. Find ways to get in front of hiring managers so that they know who you are and have you on their radar for when those opportunities become available. And here's the good news. From what I'm hearing from a lot of employers, they are preparing themselves to hire again. So they may not have opportunities now, but they already have an idea of the opportunities that they are going to be um, hiring for in the near future. So with that in mind, I think they would, <laughs> they would love to just get a resume in their inbox for a position they haven't advertised yet and then prepare themselves to interview you knowing that they're going to be hiring soon for that position. So expand your boundaries, research companies that you think are a good fit, and go ahead and send your, your resume um, and cover letter to them. Now, with those opportunities, I'm going to give you a warning. There's a little bit of a caveat. With those opportunities, you are more likely to get ghosted because they don't have an available position. But it is a risk that I think is worth you taking. It's worth the extra time. Um, so with that, let's move on to engagement strategies during the interview process. Um, one thing that is important during an interview, um, in addition to demonstrating that you're qualified, um, demonstrating that you have the skills to do the job, that you are passionate about the work, that you are the ideal candidate for them, it's something that we call the likability factor. And this is part of the reason some people get ghosted and some people get follow-ups. Um, what is important during the interview process um, is that they walk away liking you. They have to like you as a person and as a professional. Um, I have never in the history of placing anyone in a job um, heard of a hiring manager hiring someone that they didn't perceive as likable. Um, they choose people that they feel um, they are able to connect with. So I call this the likability factor. And there's one strong indicator that the interviewer likes you, and that's laughter. Um, Whenever I am meeting with hiring managers, new hiring managers, and trying to secure their business, 
once I know that I've done a really great job at explaining who I am and the value that I bring to the table, the next thing that I worry about is, do they like me? And I know that if I can make them laugh, that I probably will get their business. Um, there are times I've been in a room where there have been multiple people that I have to speak to. I know, hello, panel interviews. Um, and there's one person who's probably very reassuring, smiling the whole time and nodding. There's probably one person who's fairly neutral, but uh, occasionally you get a hint from them that you're doing well. And then there's one person that's difficult to read or you question whether or not they like you. If you can get that person to laugh, you're probably in a good place. Now, I'm not saying that you need to research your best jokes um, and go in there uh, with the goal of making everything funny. That's not the point. The point is that you want to get to a point where the conversation is more relaxed, more informal, um, and somewhere that you can connect and get a little chuckle out of them. It doesn't have to be you know, a full-throated laugh, but just a little chuckle um, is a good sign um, in terms of likability factor. Uh, for those of you who are not funny, <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes when I say this, I have a candidate who's like, I'm just not that funny. Um, there's nothing that I say that people laugh at really, um, or I get so nervous um, that you know it comes off as awkward and not funny. I get it. Um, for you, the likability factor is going to be found in finding something that you're both passionate about and connecting about that. Um, it could be um, anything from uh, a certain approach um, in the work world. It could be a certain company um, that you both have connected uh, about. I've connected with people about um, different cities. I, I tell people I'm from New Orleans. They tell me how much they love the city and the food here, and we can connect about that. You can connect about sports. Um, some people love to connect about the weather, um, but you find something that you can connect about that you're passionate about talking about and connect that way as well. But walk away from that interview feeling like your likability factor has gone above 50%. Um, the second thing is everyone wants someone who is wanted. I relate this to um, dating in high school. Um, so if uh, anyone recalls high school or if high school wasn't that long ago for you, um, typically, um, as you're deciding who you want to date, you want to pick someone that you feel other people want to date. Um, and if no one wants to date that person, you probably don't want to date them either. Now, uh, fortunately for many of us, <laughs> sure figure out that that is a, a bad way to make a decision about who you're going to date or not. Um, but what is interesting is a similar behavior occurs in the work world. Um, so for job seekers, um, typically hiring managers want to hire people that other employers want to hire, which is why you see so many people get recruited from positions that they're in over candidates who are in between jobs. Because when presented to the hiring manager, they typically favor the person who is in a job um, currently. Um, does that mean all hope is lost if you're um, between jobs? Absolutely not. But there is a way that you can um, be transparent about your job search efforts, particularly when there are other opportunities on the table. Um, if you are interviewing multiple places, the interviews are going well, you're getting invited to second, third, final interviews, um, it is okay to share that uh, with a, a potential employer. Um, for example, I recently worked with uh, someone who was job searching for a lengthy period of time. Um, she had been looking for a job, had been largely unsuccessful. Um, and so she decided that she needed to do something different. Um, and so she came to me and the first thing that we did was change her resume. So using some of those tips that I mentioned before, um, we were able to get her resume in front of eligible employers 
And they started actually calling her and inviting her to interviews. In fact, she said in about a two to three month period um, before we changed her resume and her approach, she had gotten about three to four interviews total in that time period. Um, after we updated her resume and changed her approach, um, she started getting interviews, three or four interviews each week. Um, <laughs> so she was in high demand um, once she put herself in a position to stand out from the crowd. Um, what was interesting is that as she continued through that process, um, you know, she started telling the uh, potential employers hey, I'm interviewing at other places and they're moving forward to late stages. Um, this actually ignited something in these hiring managers um, and they were more eager um, to hire her. They moved her through the hiring process faster and it also helped with salary negotiations. She was able to get top of the range. Um, what's interesting is that after job searching for months, um, she changed her approach. She was very transparent about other opportunities on the table, and she got three job offers, three. Um, she's like, I go from no interviews to three job offers. How does that happen? Again, increasing likability, figuring out how to stay in touch, um, and making sure that you present yourself as someone that other employers want to hire. Um, so you can leverage that, just be transparent um, and put yourself out there so that you're talking to multiple employers at one time, if possible. If that's not possible, there is another route that you can take, which is to consider contract roles or temporary roles. A lot of folks decide that they don't want to do temporary roles because their goal is to get a full-time permanent position. And I get that. Sometimes the temporary role may pay less than what you're looking for. Now, I get that there are some things that you have to consider as it relates to maybe um, collecting unemployment benefits or things like that. Um, but if you are not getting unemployment or the money that you would get in a temporary role is higher than that, I strongly encourage you to consider it. Um, so um, if you consider these temporary roles and you decide to take one, employers know when you're in a temporary role that your goal is a full-time permanent position. So they are not surprised if you start a contract role and then midway through it say, hey, I have to go because I got a permanent job offer. Um, the good news um, for people who have taken up these roles is it increases um, that area where there's someone who is wanted. So practically, I have worked in both temp and direct hire um, throughout my recruiting career. Occasionally, I find really good professionals that my clients really want to hire temp. And sometimes they have the thought in mind that this person is going to transition to a permanent position. Um, sometimes I have folks that are interviewing for these temporary roles and they're also interviewing for permanent roles. They think the opportunity is going well for the permanent position, um, so they turn down an offer for a temporary role. <clears throat> Guys, more than 50% of the time when someone turns down a temporary role because they think that they're in a good position for a permanent role, they call me back weeks later to say that they did not get the permanent role and want to see what other opportunities exist. By that point, we, of course, have found someone else for the temporary position. Um, whenever I have someone who is faced with both and they accept the temporary role, I end up having to fill that temporary role again in a matter of weeks because as soon as they tell this potential employer that they're interviewing for a, uh, a permanent role with, that they accepted a temporary position, but they're still you know, open for this permanent role, for some reason, the employer for the permanent role decides, no, I need to hire you. Let me make an offer. 
<laughs> so there is some benefit um, to taking temporary roles. And trust me, um, as someone who owns a staffing firm, we get it. Whenever someone who's in a temp position gets a permanent role, whether that's through us or on their own, we celebrate it because that is the goal. So you can use those two techniques, um, again, to create this, this feeling of being desired, similar to the guy that you dated in high school that other people probably wanted to date too. All right, engagement strategies post-interview. Now this is probably the danger zone for most people. This is where most hiring managers will ghost you. After the interview is over, um, you have no idea what's happening next um, and you don't hear from them again. Um, so there's a few things that you can do um, to help um, to make sure that you don't uh, get ghosted. Um, one is set expectations um, before you leave that interview. Um, some hiring managers do really well where they, they will say, um, hey, um, you can expect to hear back from us uh, in two weeks. Um, you can expect to hear back from us after we conclude this round of interviews, which may be in the next month. But they at least give you some sense of a timeline. If they don't do that, one of your questions at the end of the interview needs to be about what are the next steps? When should you expect to hear from them again? Um, we do that in sales as well, right? If I speak to um, a potential client and they say, okay, you know, we're going to evaluate this and we'll get back to you. I do not end that conversation without having an idea of when I can expect to hear back from them. And once that deadline passes, it is fair game for you to check in and say, you know, hey, just checking in, wanted to see an update. The last time we talked, you mentioned that you, you may have a decision within a week, just checking in to see where you were with that decision, okay? Um, it gives you a reason to follow up. Otherwise, um, you end up, um, you know, mentally torn between, when do I reach out? Do I re is, is a week too early? Should I wait two weeks before I reach out and ask them the status of the search? Is it, is it uh, too many times that I'm reaching out? <laughs> Save yourself the stress trouble by setting expectations before you conclude the interview. That goes for phone interviews, web interviews, in-person interviews. Make sure you walk away knowing what the next steps are. Um, the next way to set yourself apart and also check in is through a thank you note. Um, now, I'll be honest with you, less people are using thank you notes um, than ever before. Um, as a recruiter, I get fewer thank you notes um, than I did in the past. Hiring managers have told me that they get fewer thank you notes than they've gotten in the past. Um, so the thing about thank you notes is it is ripe with opportunity. Um, through a thank you note, you get to one, check in again with the hiring manager. Um, two, you get to reiterate why they should hire you. And three, you can resolve anything that maybe was left outstanding during the interview. Um, if you've ever walked away from an interview and thought to yourself, gosh, I wish I would have told them this story. You can do that through a thank you note. Um, now, here's the thing. Um, it can't just be any thank you note. It has to be a good thank you note. Um, occasionally, I do get some thank you notes that are just terrible. Um, <laughs> so to me, you know, I, I definitely take it in stride. It's good that they sent something. Um, but uh, sometimes I would <laughs> really prefer if they would just take a little while longer to write a good one. Um, so a thank you note should definitely uh, confirm your interest and excitement in the position. 
um, you should take an opportunity to mention something that the interviewer mentioned during the interview. It's a detail, a project they're working on, uh, something that they're, they want to celebrate. It could even be something personal. Maybe there's a restaurant that they said that they love and um, you decided to take your family there um, to have dinner. Whatever it may be, mention something that happened in the interview. Otherwise, it sometimes feel as if the thank you note was prepared before the interview even took place. Even though you can start to prepare them before the interview takes place, that little detail will set you apart. The thing about thank you notes is because so few people send them and because those who do, sometimes they're really bad, it makes you look really special and unique and great when you send a thank you note. Um, Sometimes that jogs the person um, to reach out to you again because you sent such a lovely thank you note. Um, sometimes they say thank you. Sometimes they know, yes, I want to move this person to the next stage. Um, if they walk away from the interview and they're busy, um, you know, they get a nice thank you note and they're like, oh my gosh, let me go ahead and move them to the next stage of the process. It is a gentle nudge, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. Um, but it sets you apart. It, it, it increases your chances of hearing from them again. And it's an opportunity to sell yourself. So for me, thank you notes are a no brainer. You should send them every time you interview. Even if you interview with the same person multiple times, find multiple different ways to tell them thank you for the time and mention new details that you learn in the interview. Um, now, there are some rules around thank you notes. I typically say that you should send a thank you note within 24 hours of the interview electronically. Um, at the latest, you wanna send it within three days. There is some reason why you may wanna delay a day or two. Maybe it's because you wanna make sure the thank you note is good, or you want, you, they said that they will follow up with you um, within a few days and you just wanna, again, send it more as a reminder um, as well. But within three days, you wanna send a thank you note um, electronically via email. Um, if you want to get bonus points, handwritten thank you notes, um, warm my heart every time I get them. Um, now, right now, it may be a difficult time with sending handwritten thank you notes for a number of reasons, COVID related, um, mail service slowed down, um, and then you don't even know if they're working in the office. You can, of course, ask, and if they are, send it to their office. Um, and if they say, oh, you know, I go in maybe once a week, you can let them know that they can expect uh, a note from you in the mail, um, you know, hopefully within the next week or two. Um, but it, again, it is a way that sets you apart. Few people send thank you notes to begin with. Even fewer people are sending them as a handwritten note in the mail, okay? It makes you different, um, sets you apart from the crowd. Post-interview, you're going to want to put together a series of what I call gentle nudges. Um, these are ways that you remind the hiring manager, hey, I'm here. <laughs> Don't forget about me. Um, so it's ways to connect and, and stay connected. Um, but you want to be careful because you also don't want to annoy them. Um, there are folks who sometimes want to email me every week. I encourage them whenever I can not to do that. Um, sending me an email every week asking me the same question is not going to change anything, okay? Um, it is likely going to do the opposite of what you want and lead me to actually ghost you um, if you are reaching out to me too frequently. Um, so you want to, of course, space it out. Um, and find different ways other than just emails to stay in front of that hiring manager. So here are some tips. One, um, through setting ex expectations in the thank you note and other ways, you want to find reasons to connect. Um, so um, you may send them an email um, because when you talk to them during the interview, um, they mentioned they were volunteering at
as a, uh, a, a volunteer for the election. This actually happened to me recently. I needed to reach out to someone. Um, and I remembered that she told me she was volunteering as a um, poll watcher for the election. And so I sent her a note and it started off, of course, with, you know, wow, the election's done and hopefully everything went smoothly for you at your polling place. Um, you know, how did it go? I'm interested to hear about your experience. By the way, here are some other things that I needed to send you, okay? So if you, if you find those moments of connection in the interview, remember, you're trying to increase the likability factor. Um, if you find those moments of connection, then you have reasons to follow up, right? If you find out that they are, they're having a major event um, next week um, and you want to follow up with them then, send them a note. Hey, how did that event go? I was thinking about you or I saw a commercial about it. Um, if you know that they have, um, you know, a huge vacation coming up, email them after. How did that vacation go? Um, by the way, I'm still here. Any updates? Um, so by connecting it to something else, people start feeling less annoyed because they feel like you're, you, you actually took interest in them. Again, it has a dual purpose, right? Um, because they think, hey, you listened to me and you thought enough of me to follow up. Of course, they're gonna give you an update at that point. They won't leave you hanging um, because then that would be awkward um, for you to care enough about them to ask those questions um, and them not to say anything at all. Be sure to leverage social media. And I'm, I'm about to tell you different ways that you can leverage social media, but you can also stay in front of them by connecting with them through platforms like LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, so we'll talk about that in a moment. I'll leave that as a, a little bit of a cliffhanger. Um, but last but not least, offer an escape. Um, so if you have a hiring manager um, that you've reached out to, they haven't responded to you, you don't know why, um, and it's been a significant amount of time, don't do this the first time you reach out. You need to have reached out a few times before you offer an escape, which is simply a message that says, you know, hey, I'm just following up with you again. I sent you a couple of messages, not sure if you've received them or had a chance to review them. Um, just want to check in and see what the status is um, with that position um, that I applied for. Um, if I'm not a good fit, um, you know, I certainly understand if you could just let me know <laughs> so that I can stop reaching out to you, I would appreciate it. One of two things will typically happen when you offer that escape. They're either going to reach back out to you to let you know, yes, they, they're not moving forward with you as a candidate and you can close that door. Or they're gonna say, wait, 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 no, no. Things are delayed longer than we were anticipating and I haven't reached out to you because I didn't have an update, I'm sorry. But by offering that escape, it's kind of a trigger to say, all right, you're ignoring me. I know you're ignoring me. Um, can you give me an update? Otherwise, I'm going to assume the worst. Um, so we do that again with our clients as well. When we don't hear anything back and we reach out a few times, we offer them an escape. Let me know. I'm going to assume that you're not interested. Let me know if that's different. Otherwise, I'm going to move forward. I'm going to you know, release these candidates or I'm going to close this search. And almost always our client responds to us to let us know where things are. So you can use the same approach um, in the hiring process. So as I mentioned, let's talk a little bit about those engagement strategies as it relates to social media. Three things that you should keep in mind uh, first, um, it's important that you know what people can see about you online. If you have not done a Google search on yourself lately, please do so, so that you can see what other people see. Um, and if there are certain things that you may want to um, restrict so that only your friends can see it versus anyone, do so. Some people use their social media and they want everyone to see it. And that's great too. But you wanna make sure that you are clear on what people are seeing as they Google you. 
um, make sure that you have a complete profile um, and that you engage on social media regularly. It does you no good to have a really great LinkedIn profile um, or great pictures um, for um, Facebook and you're not posting anything. There's no content. So make sure that you're posting, commenting, and sharing regularly so that they get a sense of the things that are important to you as well. Um, you want to engage with hiring managers and recruiters um, via social media. Um, one way that you can do it, I, I like to think of this as the way that you do it um, without them noticing is a profile view. Um, typically before I interview someone, I notice that they look at my LinkedIn profile. That's good. They know that you're doing your homework, you're doing your research, and that you took a look at their profile. Um, afterwards, sometimes I look at their profile again. For those professionals that pay attention to who's looking at their profile, that will score you points. So at the very least, find them on these platforms and take a look at their page. Next is a connection invitation. Remember those gentle nudges? Here's one that you can do. I don't recommend doing it immediately after the interview, but maybe a week later, send a connection invitation, a lovely note. I, I enjoyed meeting with you last week. Um, and then again, that puts your face, your profile in front of them as a gentle reminder, hey, I'm here. And they get to evaluate um, you through your profile. Again, it's another touch point. Once you're connected to them, like, share, and comment on their posts. There are people, there are you know, certain job seekers that like or share or comment on nearly every post that TDG posts. I know who they are. They are on my radar. As soon as I have something that's a good fit for them, they are at the top of my list of people to call. Why? Because I see them all the time because they're liking, sharing, and commenting on our posts. So that's a way where you can say I'm here without even saying I'm here. They'll just see your name. They'll see your picture pop up um, because you're engaging with them on social media. So this is definitely a time to do that. Um, you know, staying in front of people, becoming that person that people know and see um, on social media. And I certainly recommend um, that you leverage it. Now, I'm no social media expert. And I know that there are plenty of people uh, who are, and I'm sure Danette has had people who specialize in this um, in the group before. Um, but I certainly recommend that that becomes a part of your strategy. So those are all the tips that I have. Danette did not interrupt me, so I'm assuming no one had any questions. But if you do have questions, um, feel free to let me know now. I'm here to answer those. Um, Otherwise, um, please keep in touch um, with the D 